And we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to our Wednesday night webinar that we host through NoCD. NoCD is a downloadable free app that you can get through the iOS or uh, the Google Play Store. And we have a website, treatmyocd.com. We are live in 23 states currently with uh, therapy for teletherapy for people. And we are continuing, as always, to have more and more insurance companies come on as well, too, so that that will cover no CD therapy for people across the country, since one of our missions is to be sure that we apply or we have affordable health care available for all. Now, tonight with me is Dr. Eric Storch, good friend of mine. Hello, Eric. Good to see you. Hey there. And before we launch in, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements, Eric, if you give me a moment. Um, starting next week and what we will do going forward through NoCD with this webinar is every third Wednesday, we will have a topic called Diversity Matters. And that will be a new initiative that we are starting off next week. Next week, we'll focus on how uh, OCD and the Black community uh, kind of can interact and, and what are some special considerations to take care of when we're dealing with individuals who are African-American and who have obsessive compulsive disorder. And we will have some of our African-American therapists who will be on with me next week to discuss that. And then every month going forward, we will pick different topics based on diversity issues. So be it uh, orientation, be it disability concerns or ability concerns, be it uh, various creeds, religions, race, gender things, whatever it might be, we are going to have a schedule that are coming up. But right now, since we are in the midst of getting everything going, we are excited just to announce this to everybody. So uh, it will be a great third Wednesdays every month going forward. Because Eric, as you probably know, sometimes things happen in our country and we say, we need to do something. And then everyone says, Ah, let's go back to doing what we were doing. So we're not going to do that. We are going to make sure that going forward every single month, that third Wednesday of every month is going to be focused on some kind of diversity issue going forward. So we're really excited about that. Our therapists at NoCD are really revved up about it too. They're already getting me ideas about things that they want to work on and present and everything as well. So it's an exciting time for us at NoCD to really push into this area of how do we make sure that we're looking at all forms of diversity and how OCD interacts with that too. So tonight, Eric, welcome. Uh, it's so, so happy to be here with you tonight. And I know Eric, you've already put in the chat area that you guys have a study that you're doing. Do you wanna just talk about that for a minute first? And then we'll kind of launch into what you do and how you do things, but I'd love you to take a moment. We'll review it again at the end too, but if you wanna yeah. take a moment first. No, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, you know, one of the fun things about my gig is that uh, I get to work with people um, who are affected with OCD and try to help them uh, get to a better place in life. And then the other piece is, is contributing to, to science. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're fortunate that uh, we got a, an R01, which is a, a large grant from the National Institute of Mental Health. And in this case, it was trying to understand um, a type of, of uh, surgical intervention that is not available for kids with OCD, but is used as a sort of a, a final resort or last resort for adults with OCD who have been really treatment refractory. Um, now, what we're doing is, is super simple. Um, we're, we're looking for uh, parents of uh, adolescents or the adolescents themselves who still have some symptoms, even though they went through, uh, whether it be uh, exposure and response prevention treatment, uh, you know, or and or medication. And we just wanna interview them to get their sense of, uh, and their perceptions about deep brain stimulation. Again, it's not an option for kids with OCD, nor do we expect it to be, but it actually is an approach that's used for kids with dystonia, uh, as mm -hmm. well as some kids with Tourette. And so what we're trying to do is understand um, how do we help parents come to a decision, um, especially relevant for dystonia and Tourette, um, uh, if, if they really haven't responded to treatment and they need to start considering that next pathway? Uh, it's about an hour interview. We do it by Zoom. Um, we pay 50 bucks uh, per person for the interview. So it's a, a perfect kind of, you know, isolated in your home type of activity. And I'll put it up here again, but it's just an email to me or my coordinator and uh, and then we, we just take it from there. Well, that's great. 
Thank you for that. All right, so Eric Storch, you are at Baylor. You want to tell us a little bit about like what you do at Baylor and your research interests and clinical interests, and then we're going to jump into a discussion tonight about OCD in kids and adolescents, which is, I know, really your wheelhouse, and that's why we had you here tonight. So. Uh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I became a Texan um, two and a half years ago. Uh, I got my first pair of cowboy boots about three weeks into that. Um, my friend convinced me to get teal boots, which I sort of regret. Um, uh, but as long as I don't pull up my jeans, they're all right. Uh, but, but what I do here, I, I wear a bunch of different hats. So uh, one hat is uh, my clinical hat, where we have a clinic that specializes in working with people with OCD. Um, and and in a, in a way, we really focus on, on those who have struggled to get uh, response to initial kind of therapies. So they're still struggling even after they had a uh, good course of therapy or a good course of medication. Um, and, and so we have a, a robust kind of group of faculty where, where this is all we do. Uh, a second kind of hat is, is really the research hat. And so we're, we're thinking about a lot of different things. You know, one are um, how effective are the interventions that we have? Um, how do we make them more effective? How do we understand um, how they work? And then a, a very consistent, uh, uh, Patrick, to what you were saying with OCD, how do we get this out to the masses? That, that's, yeah. I think, where, where we are right now. And if we know what works, how do we get it to everyone? Um, and then kind of this third hat, uh, which I, I also love, um, is really an educational one. And I think it, that dovetails with the, how do we get it out there? Uh, but it's, it's that notion of how do we train people so that, that there are more practitioners available? Um, and it, it, I've seen it over the past you know, 17 years, 18 years of my career now, which is scary, um, that, that we've, we've moved in a positive direction and we'll continue to move in that regard, although there's still much work to be done. Right. Well, and you and I have the honor of being together on the uh, International OCD Foundation's scientific and clinical advisory boards where we work on how do we get training out there to the masses. And that's a big piece for us as well, too. So it's it's exciting to work with you in that area as well. So I always like to get to do that. So absolutely. So, Eric, we're going to. I know we're going to get information tonight and questions coming in from people about OCD and kids, but maybe we could start off with a couple of basic things about uh, what are some of the biggest differences that you've seen that are uh, different between OCD in children versus the presentation of OCD in adults? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the main differences is, um, I, well, there's several. Uh, one is, is how the family is so intimately involved. Um, you can't treat a kid uh, in isolation. You have to treat their entire family. Second is the, the pattern of, of co-occurring problems uh, that come into play. So, so you don't necessarily see um, an adult uh, acting as oppositional, uh, but you may be more likely to see that in children um, or have other rage, uh, rage events. Um, on the other hand, you may see kind of reduced incidence of, of things like substance abuse, especially in younger ones, um, but there's that piece. Uh, the symptom profile generally remains about the same um, so, so while there's a, a kind of a cognitive aspect um, that that's relevant, like you won't see such sophisticated obsessions in younger kids, uh, you still see the same general content focused on have tab taboo thoughts about aggression or, or sexual topics. Um, you know, you have contamination concerns, uh, checking with aggressive obsessions, uh, and then kind of this repetition, just right ordering. Uh, so, th so in that part, it, it's largely the same. Uh, but um, but really, it's that that family embeddedness that I think is a critical critical uh, a factor that differentiates. So then, when we're looking at it from a treatment point of view, I would assume that family accommodation in OCD is a big part of treating children and adolescents and taking a look at the role the family plays in providing safety seeking behaviors. Yeah, you hit it. You hit it right on the head. Um, you know, some of the earlier studies were really interesting because. They focused on the kid individually, um, and they had some family involvement, but but within our clinic, it's, it's not how we approach it. Um, instead, our, our role is really to teach the parent uh, as a default how to be the kid's therapist. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely times where where you really you want to focus on the kid alone and kind of have the parents uh, on the side as cheerleaders. For example, the parents really anxious, or on the other hand, they're um, you know they 
have, um, you know, a lot of conflict with the child. Uh, so we might want to separate or the child's super motivated, but wants to kind of keep their parent uh, to the side, especially if the obsessions are more of a sexual nature. Mm -hmm. But by and large, we're really embracing the family together. And I think about it sort of like uh, the model for treating cancer. You want to just take the identified individual um, and say, hey, this is all on you, shoulder, shoulder the burden. Instead, we want to surround everyone who loves this kiddo um, uh, and, and have them work together to really kind of beat OCD. And unfortunately, you're going to come across families sometimes who just say, fix my kid, right? That that's going to be what, how do you, how would you deal with that kind of scenario? Is that a case that you take on and try the best that you can? Or do you really have to work on some motivational interviewing with the family? Or what, what are some of the, the ways to approach that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think one of them is, is just providing kind of good sound um, education uh, about the why to it. Um, you know, look, if we shift the environment uh, as, as best as possible to encourage the child to confront fears um, and really make this kind of the, the climate, then we're going to be more likely to be successful, not only in terms of outcome, but keeping things at bay. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. Uh, most of the time we can get there, but but sometimes we need to, to think about a different course of action. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I learned once... Uh, live uh, about checking in on students. I, I We were working with an adolescent and we assigned some ERP work for homework. And, and I said to one of my students, now make sure you call the family and kind of fill them in on what we're doing. And, and I got some very nasty uh, voicemails the next morning about your, what are you having my daughter do and everything. And I called my student in my office and I said, listen to these voicemails. And then I asked her, now you, you didn't, you didn't call the family last night, did you? And she said, no, I forgot. And and I think that it's really imperative for us as therapists to really inform the, the family about why we're doing what we're doing, or else from an outsider's point of view, it could look like a very weird, odd type of thing that we would assign someone to do. Absolutely, absolutely. We, tonight, uh, before this event, we were having a, kind of a Zoom uh, going away party for a number of my coordinators who got into grad school. Oh, um, it, it was a great event. Uh, I wish we could have been been together in person on that one, but uh, but we were joking around about how exactly that on the outside. <laughs> if you looked in, you'd be like, "Why? Why are you playing with dead cockroaches or mm -hmm. uh, holding a knife to someone's throat?" But but again, providing that rationale as you're hitting on that's the key. And I find that for most people, they understand exactly that 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 a person with OCD is is, is not at risk of harm to self or others. Um, but rather we, we need to kind of take these obsessions and attack them head on um, and really kind of, you know, take the wind from the sail, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I was excited thinking about this tonight when you were coming on because as, as I work, I've worked mostly adolescents and adults, but um, I've always had that discussion with people about who say, well, when my LCD started was this and then it switched to this and then it switched to this and now I'm coming in for this. Uh, do you, do you see that a lot in, in younger children as well, too, where there's there's a lot of switching that goes on or uh, or is it more stable until they get into adolescence? We're just interested in your kind of point of view on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, certainly if uh, it, it, on the one hand, if you've seen a person with OCD, you have seen a person with OCD and it's always quite individual mm -hmm. in general, you 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 have kind of, you know, some folks where it's pretty stable. Um, or, or kind of the undercurrent remains stable, but the symptom expression may differ. I'll mm -hmm. elaborate on that in a second. And then for others, it's variable. You know, the, I think the approach that we really focus on is, is one of recognize what's an obsession, um, uh, and, and then kind of go head first into it. When I was a kid, uh, I loved when my parents read us this book, uh, going on a bear hunt. Oh. And now that I have my own kid, yeah, good. There it is. Mm -hmm. Now, with my own kids, which you may hear uh, throughout the house, so hopefully it won't be uh, any yelling or fighting or anything. But when I read that to them, I, I kind of feel bad that I torture my parents. But you know, the whole kind of premise of that book is when you come across something difficult, you can't go around it. Um, right. You can't go over it or under it. You just got to go through it. Got to go through it. That's, mm -hmm. it. That's the way we, we think about these things.
mm -hmm. uh, and then try to learn from it. Um, you know, and and was that feared outcome likely to happen? Um, answer is usually no. Uh, were you able to cope with it? Answer is usually yes. But but we need to kind of push through those those things more directly, and that's kind of the core skill that we teach. Eric, the question I another question I see that comes up a lot is uh, family says I have to sit down and talk to them and say, did I make this happen, my child? Is it is it my fault that they have OCD? Did I? genetically contribute something to them and how do, how do you manage that question from from yeah. families if you get it yeah i i respond very uh directly it's no this isn't your fault right. um you know it, it, what we know about uh, genetics and ocd is is that there's broadly some link or, or some uh um you know kind of increased risk but it's not incredibly robust um so if I have a, a kid with OCD, um, I'm sorry, if I have OCD, uh, my wife doesn't, uh, my kid has about a four or five uh, times increased chance of having it relative to the regular population, which is about 2%. Right. So there's something there, but it, there's so much else that can come up. Um, there's also that idea of, okay, well, we can't really change uh, how this came about. Um, so instead, let's focus on where we are now and how to shift things. And we know in most cases we can get people to a much, much, much better place. Yeah, that's great. And and I've I've taken a similar kind of approach. It's just sometimes that guilt I have seen drives the family to provide as much reassurance and safety behavior as they can to their child because they feel bad that maybe they were at fault for their kid getting this. And so that becomes one of the reasons that keeps them going on helping the OCD, even though they don't know they're helping the OCD, but but at least doing those safety behaviors. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I was, uh, one of my friends had a baby recently and it was her, her first one and we were kind of joking around about, uh, uh, you know, how things change and, you know, as the, the old man who now has three babies uh, who are, are growing up too quickly, uh, as you saw right before the call, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it um, it always reminded me how ill prepared we were when we had kids. Uh, and and so when we were pregnant with our first child, uh, we ended up going to these like six two hour parenting classes that in hindsight taught us nothing. And I really regret that we didn't go see six movies because the <laughs> next time I'd see like an adult movie was, was about seven years later. Right. Uh, so, you know, here though is my point. It's, you know, it, all we know as parents is how to love our kids. And so the natural response is to be reassuring, to help them out. And, and that's a fine initial response. It's just that point where it doesn't stick. And you're going to know that really quickly um, uh, for kids uh, and kids with OCD. Um, so where you're answering the same question again and again or doing the same things or the things that they're asking you to do are, are, are just excessive. Um, those are some of the signs uh, that, that you want to think about with accommodation um, and uh, work with, with someone to help kind of eliminate them uh, because it's just going to perpetuate the whole cycle. Yeah. Um, some of the things that I've seen that are maybe different you know, or, or maybe more unique, I should say, ways that I, uh, kids have presented is sometimes around the nighttime rituals, saying I love you to mom and dad, having to say your nightly prayers, making sure mom and dad say I love you back in a certain way uh, that uh, I've noticed that a lot of those things maybe start off very innocently, but it, it, someone described it once, it's kind of like your hair growing. You don't really notice it every day, but now I look and I like, geez, I really need a haircut, right? But I, I won't notice tomorrow that it's any longer than today. Uh, how, how have you seen some different things with kids just that that gradual growth of something until the point where the families are like, holy crap, how did we get here? Yeah. Yeah. First, I, I, I'm a little bit offended about the hair comments. I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm you with, with all that, but. Uh, well, you said you wore multiple hats earlier. I was going to ask you if there was just one to cover the, <laughs> cover the ball here. Yeah, it makes me aerodynamic a little bit quicker. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, the symptoms tend to run this stock market course uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, gradual severity up and down, up and down, but then kind of sloping positive. And so in most cases, there's this point where the parents don't really see it as a problem until it starts becoming a problem. And then in hindsight, they look back 
And, and the, you know, they'll say, oh, like, yeah, I, I remember that. Or, you know, I saw it, but I just thought it was, you know, Johnny being Johnny. Um, and, and so the challenge, though, is if we don't intervene, um, you know, at that time point where it's recognized to be a problem, we start seeing this course where things get worse and worse. Um, I think the hope is is that with increased recognition, we can, you know, intervene earlier, uh, but but also uh, kind of reduce that latency between onset of symptoms or diagnosis uh, and subsequent treatment. Which in the past, when we, you know, you and I both started, I mean, it was like ten years, fifteen years, uh, and I think that's what you know we're all kind of working towards. I want to jump in. There's a couple of questions that have come in. So the fun part of this is to get to do a little Q&A. And instead of just having people listen to me yap every week, it's nice to have a guest to come in and you could yap for a while. So uh, Kimberly says, my 15-year-old daughter sometimes has bad thoughts that she did something wrong when she was sleeping. How can I help her believe she didn't? Mm -hmm. So here's here's the challenge, uh, I think, with, with a lot of types of OCD. And I, I alluded to this on some level, you know, we can see the the kind of symptom expression. So this intrusive thought that I did something wrong um, and, and what's underneath the surface. So like, you know, the iceberg part under the water is this notion of pathological doubt and uncertainty. That's kind of driving this. And that can come in a variety of fashions. You know, I, maybe I, I don't love, uh, you know, love my boyfriend. I saw, saw someone mention that. Um, yeah. Maybe I, you know, uh, grab someone's chest uh, when when I was playing with them, um, and you know, oh my God, uh, I can't believe I did that to a child. Um, so, so what we want to think about is, is first of all, kind of accepting this aspect of uncertainty that that we don't know um, what's going to happen. Now, in this case, we're pretty darn confident that in the middle of the night she didn't uh, wake up, uh, go downstairs, and do whatever, uh, but. But we want to expose her to that possibility of the feared outcome happening. And so we want to think a lot about what are the rituals she's doing, whether it's reassurance seeking or confessing or checking things or putting tape on her door so that, you know, she knows if she went out, uh, you know, buckling herself into bed. Um, uh, and we want to kind of gradually have her exposed uh, to that fear and that potential of the thing that she's afraid of happening, in fact, happening. Now, we know it's not going to in her case. Uh, uh, but but we need her to see that herself without kind of telling her that. Now, there are other things we can do, too. So we can break that down to different steps, um, which which might be having her take a nap in the afternoon. Um, uh, it, we could have, tell stories about it again and again. Uh, I always joke, uh, my wife loves the movie Steel Magnolias, which uh, being kind of a macho child psychologist, <laughs> obviously is not consistent with my repertoire of movies. I didn't um, know macho and child psychologist went together, but that, that's interesting anyway. So, yeah. 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 I, I think it's just assumed, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but, but anyway, I digress. Uh, so I, I tried to use this. This was the one time the scripts really failed on me, um, where I tried to show her this kind of same scene where Sally Fields is bemoaning the, the loss of her child. Um, and, and so the whole idea was that if I kept playing the same scene again and again and again and again, she'd get bored by it. Um, it was only partially successful, and it did mean I had to watch that scene way too many times. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but we can tell stories that initially elicit kind of an anxious response, but then gradually over time with repeated pairings um, uh, start becoming you know, less anxiety-provoking. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of things that we can do with regards to that. What happens for, with all parents um, is that our first response is, is that we're logical. And we just try to talk to them about it. And that's absolutely the first thing you should do. Um, because in most cases, you know, that initial fear will go away. Um, but, but in the case of OCD, it, it doesn't. And so that's where you see it sticking around again and again and again. And that's where we want to have her kind of, you know, again, go right through uh, uh, that feared fear trigger. Yeah. And, and I think something you, you said that I just want to really, you know, emphasizes that notion that we're never going to convince her that she didn't do something or that she could not have done something right so it, it is about sitting with that discomfort of what if i might have done something and maybe or maybe you will right uh, we we just don't don't know you know i i often use the example of uh 
I don't know when I get in the car next time that I will arrive where I'm going, but I'm still going to drive there, right? right. So that, so it. I've always found it interesting in the OCD aspect of things that there are areas that we have no 100% assurance in our life that we are fine with. And there's other areas that OCD says, but I'm not fine with this area. This area has to have driving. Okay, I accept that. But this other thing that I, I have to 100% know that I didn't do something overnight or something like that. So that's yeah. always interesting. Quick reminder, everyone, this is the Wednesday night webinar provided to you by No CD. No CD is an app for obsessive compulsive disorder that is downloadable on the iOS or Google Play Store. And on the other side of Eric there, through through his head up to the yellow box with the blue highlight, you can click on that. You can speak to our care team for a free 15-minute call to see if setting up a diagnostic assessment with one of our NoCD therapists across the country might be helpful for you. We are live in 23 states, and we continue to get more and more insurance companies helping to cover us as well, too, to provide you with very science evidence-based treatment for an affordable price. Here's another one, Eric. Uh, and, and I bet kids have a lot of this, especially with the social media piece. I have obsessions with other people. What's the best way to get rid of this besides not following them on social media? I've tried that already. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. It, it, so th that one's a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I think trying to think of how best to respond to that. I think in some instances, uh, I, I, what you tried, which didn't work, absolutely can work. So, mm -hmm. so you start kind of, you know, just eliminating that. Um, now, some of the other things we do, though, is we think a lot about what what kind of the really the, the function of that individual might be. Um, so is it that you're concerned about what they're doing um, because maybe they're going on a date with someone um, uh, or uh, what they're thinking or their preference for something? Um, and so in that case, what we'll actually do is, is develop scripts that, that kind of lead themselves, it sounds a little bit mean, but directly inconsistent with what you want them, want them to be doing. Right. So, for example, if you were thinking of, a, you know, your ex-girlfriend uh, is going out with, uh, you know, someone else. And the worst person in the world would be that they're going out with your arch enemy. Um, <laughs> and we would develop kind of a story where we start getting you used to that. Hmm. Now, for everyone, it's always different, too. Right. Uh, sometimes we see, you know, OCD kind of co-occur with some impulsivity, um, things that we, we want to kind of, you know, check in and make sure that, uh, you know, that... that Someone's that, uh, dying in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. Um, but, uh, but we want to make sure that we're capturing all kind of the nuances uh, at play, because certainly we know that OCD can, you know, can occur with things like anxiety or depression. Um, and especially in kids, uh, some challenges with ADHD in a small, small subgroup of those, those uh, individuals. Sure. Can your OCD be affected over, uh, by the death of a parent? That's, I, have you had something like that, Eric? Where, or, yeah. or a grandparent maybe or something? How, how do kids with OCD and death kind of intermingle? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So th there's an increasing literature that focuses on uh, kind of this notion of uh, whether it be a a trauma per se, or just a very stressful life event, uh, being either a trigger point or an exacerbation point for OCD. Sure. Uh, and we certainly see this uh, happen with, with regularity. Um, in kids, we've, we've seen this in two different manners. Um, so, so we've seen some kids have their OCD manifest um, uh, secondary to some sort of traumatic event. So I've seen it with uh, death of a parent. Um, okay. And, and I've also seen it with peer problems. So the peer problems, uh, there was one kiddo I remember who, whenever he was bullied, uh, he would wash himself to decontaminate from the, the bully's remarks. Okay. On the death of a parent, uh, it was someone who felt like they were responsible. Um, and, and even kind of taking that a step further, I've seen tons and tons of kiddos who they're concerned um, uh, that, that kind of the outcome is on their shoulders. So one one kid I, re I remember uh, who almost ended up killing himself uh, accidentally was uh, insistent that if he didn't uh, touch the rock at the bottom of a quarry, which is probably about 14 feet deep, oh uh, that gosh. his mom would get cancer. 
And so he kept diving down there, diving down, diving down um, until he almost drowned. Um, And so in that case, it was a a little bit different than perhaps what's being asked, where there's this inflated sense of responsibility falling on their shoulders. that They had to make sure it didn't go down. I think in other cases, though, it's it's this negative uh, traumatic outcome that happens. And so the child ends up um, engaging in either magical thinking type uh, uh, symptoms, uh, checking uh, compulsions and things like that to ensure that the spirit outcome doesn't take place. Sure. And then, of course, if there is a sudden death, say, of uh, someone in the family, OCD will probably want to pick on that and say, well, it's because you didn't do the ritual at the right way or the right time or something and and can lead to a lot of blame then uh, for the person who has OCD saying, this just proves why you need to do the things that I want you to do because OCD loves a coincidence and takes advantage of it whenever it can. Well said. It, it loves a coincidence. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and I think they're, you know, to the earlier point about kind of genetics, um, you know, they're, sometimes there are folks who are anxious and, and a life event um, can kind of grab onto that and then kind of be, you know, again, that water to the sea that lets it grow. Uh, yeah. This is probably a great one, although Sarah asked this probably for herself, but I think that this would apply so very well to children as well, too. How can I not get so upset when things don't go exactly right? So maybe I, I know I've seen with schoolwork, I, I, the, there's a hole in the paper because I erased so many times because I didn't cross the T at a 90 degree angle. The I dot wasn't exactly above or, or, or I colored out of the lines and now the whole art project is ruined and I, I throw it away or something. And, and so uh, what are some of the just right manifestations that we see with children? and how parents can kind of help dealing with some of those things as well too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> just right manifestations tend to be really similar to adults, um, but in a child context. So uh, we're more likely to have kids, uh, you know, handwriting things, uh, writing, erasing, writing, erasing, uh, now typing, retyping, um, a lot of kind of repetition, opening and closing doors, turning on and off light switches, um, lining things up, um, putting things down repetitively, um, you know, kind of evening out rituals, bump this elbow, do that one. Uh, and we could go on on this. Sure. But very similar to, to adults there. Um, I think from the standpoint of parents uh, uh, and kids alike, the best advice I can give is strike while the iron's cold. So if you ever think about when you argue with a loved one, um, you know, if you're both arguing each other, um, you're never going to, no one ever wins on that. Um, no. You both end up kind of talking over each other and then you go your separate ways and that's that. Um, as opposed to the aftermath where someone comes forward and says, hey, you know, I'm really sorry this, but here's what I was thinking, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to that better point. Right. Uh, uh, and I think that's the task here. So as kids are getting um, more and more upset, if you're not able to catch it early, um, give a little bit of a break. Uh, now, not a break that gets them out of doing the work that they have to do. They have to do that. We don't want them to get out of it. But we want to cool down the situation um, in order for them to be able to kind of uh, re-engage in it in a more effective manner. Um, now, I, I think that's the best thing that we can do uh, uh, at that point. Of course, integrating some of the therapeutic uh, concepts that you'd learn, you know, with a with your clinician, with no CD, so on. Um, you know, in terms of exposure therapy, in terms of kind of relaxing yourself, um, th- those are, are the kind of the core things uh, to use at, at the beginning. But again, if it doesn't work, that's where you want to kind of cool it down um, and then, then you know, pivot and then reapply. Yeah. Uh, the other one that I, I remember that I wanted to ask you before we get back into some of these is, there's a unique aspect, and, and I've dealt with this when I've worked with adolescents as well when we're looking at OCD, in we're used to very often OCD taking kind of that flight response, right? How can I, how can I do whatever I can to get you away from the fear uh, in, in some ways? But sometimes it could take the fight response where, oh, you're not gonna do what I want you to do? Well, I'm going to yell and scream. I'm gonna punch walls. I'm gonna throw things around the house. I'm gonna threaten to harm myself. And 
there are times that I have said to families, you, you have to kind of come up and make a choice of when do you get, say, the authorities involved in a situation because OCD will use threats and intimidations at times to get everybody to comply and do what it wants everybody to do. And I have uh, talked to families who say, my child runs our household, right? That we're only allowed to use one bathroom in the home. We can't use the other two because they're contaminated. We're only allowed to buy certain kinds of brands of food because other brands are contaminated. We're not allowed to have friends over at the house because they might bring contamination in. And if we do any of these things, things get broken and everything like that. Uh, what are what are some of your guidelines for where you decide maybe we have to look at an inpatient stay or or authorities get involved in a family situation so that harm doesn't come to self or others or the home or damage or things like that? Yeah. So I, I remember um, meeting with this mom and uh, it was, it, it, it was an incredible moment. Uh, in fact, this ended up uh, being the basis for probably one of the most cited papers that we published. Um, and so the, the mom was talking about how she regrets engaging in family accommodation, uh, but if she doesn't, her child will tear the house apart. Mm -hmm. and, and she got a couple young kids. Uh, and, and so it, it was this concern of, you know, I, I don't wanna do this, but I have to do this. Um, and so we ended up uh, at conducting a study and, and publishing it on rage attacks in kids with OCD. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and rage might be the wrong term, anger is more it, but, but I, I think in general about those anger attacks, um, when they're at more kind of a, a mild to moderate level, as functioning exactly like rituals. Um, and so what you wanna do is persevere through it um, without giving in because you'll see it dissipate and, you know, and the person didn't get away with, uh, with what they're afraid of. When it escalates beyond the moderate range, though, that's exactly, Dr. McGrath, what you're talking about. And, and so we, we need to think about what our options are at that point. Um, you know, when someone becomes risk of harming self or others, and it, it moves really from this possibility to likely, uh, then, then you have to call, call the police. Um, and I always think about it in terms of, you know, run away to fight another day type of scenario. We have to keep people safe because if we don't, then there's no chance of, of beating OCD. Um, and so that's kind of a, a big piece. Um, now, on the other hand, we, we do see a fair number of kids who will, will make claims that are really reflective of how upset they are, um, but maybe doesn't go that pathway uh, in terms of, of actually harming oneself. Uh, and so it could be in the form of, you know, I, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill myself or, um, you know, or something kind of along that, that pathway. Um, and I think in that scenario, you really have to take it seriously. Now, one of the approaches that we've used um, where, where someone is, is kind of in that gray area um, and, and we're, you know, as a family, comfortable that, that this isn't going to happen, uh, but, but we aren't quite sure, and we're certainly concerned about the severity, uh, is that we'll have parents do sit-ins. Uh, and so it's, it's not disrespectful, but it, instead it's parents saying, you know, uh, you know, Johnny, we love so much, um, and you said this, and we really take it seriously. Um, and because of that, um, you know what? Dad's going to sleep in your room tonight. Um, in a sleeping bag, which, you know, for his old bones, uh, it's going to be difficult, but this is how much we care. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's kind of an intermediate point. That said, I think there are some instances where, where that standard outpatient just isn't a high enough level of care. And, right. and so if we're worried about safety, that's reserved for these inpatient programs. But if we're thinking more about, um, you know, it, outpatient treatment's just not working, safety is not the main concern, uh, but rather being able to have the right amount of treatment, then we might want to think about an OCD specialty program that really focuses on, you know, on OCD, but gives more than just, you know, an hour or two or three hours a week of, of therapy. That's a great call. Thank you for that. 
Uh, everyone, welcome once again. This is the Wednesday night webinar through OCD. Tonight we have Dr. Eric Storch with us as our guest to talk about child and adolescent OCD. Dr. Storch has also listed some information about a study that they're doing at Baylor, so you can contact him for that information. He's left the information to call or email about it, and uh, it's an exciting study. I'm, I'm actually very excited. I, having done two adult DBS uh, cases myself and having been in the operating room while they were doing it to talk to the patient in live while they were doing the surgery. And I'll tell you, it's a fascinating thing to actually look into someone's brain while you're talking to them. It's 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 kind of a surreal thing, and having not been a surgeon, but having now had the opportunity to do such a thing. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One other announcement for everybody out there. Next week, we start our Diversity Matters series. It will be the third Wednesday of every month going forward, where we will be doing discussions around various diversity matters. And we're excited uh, this, this first Wednesday next week to have some of our African-American therapists who will be joining us to talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter and OCD and how OCD affects the African-American community and things that we've learned from some of the research that's out there already about. And, and our friend Monica Williams has done a great deal of that research and, and some of the great work that she's done. Uh, so we'll be discussing some, some things around those areas next week. So join us uh, next week for our first inaugural Diversity Matters series. Uh, Dr. Storch, we have a, my 10 year old has OCD and I don't. We're done, or we've done talk therapy and we'll go see about meds next week. Is ERP something to consider even if my child is 10 years old? Absolutely, and it's funny, I, I was just looking at that one and uh, starting to reply and then, then <laughs> um, so it, it absolutely is. Um, you know, one of the, the neat things again about doing a lot of research is is that we can kind of say, hey, been there, done that, um, and, and actually did the studies on it. So we have published a bunch of the really kind of seminal type papers in Kitty OCD. Now, one of those included a randomized controlled trial of kids with OCD uh, as young as three years of age. Um, and we found excellent results. Um, we published a paper a few years ago, and this, this paper I loved. Uh, we were, we we're trying to understand if we targeted uh, exposure and response prevention, which is the gold standard treatment for OCD, kids and adults, but if we targeted with this old uh, antibiotic in a tiny dose, did it make the therapy work better? And we had a theory about why it might. Um, now, there's the good and bad news. Bad news is the moment that we unblinded the study and analyzed it, uh, we had these two groups, both with therapy, one with the medicine, um, one without the antibiotic. Um, we found that they were literally the exact same. So like 10 years of research in that one moment, uh, nothing. Um, now, on the other hand, um, what we ended up seeing uh, is, is that we started with about 172 kids. Um, we had 30 of them stop treatment uh, after three sessions because they got better. Uh, and so we didn't want to randomly assign them to either uh, you know, 10 doses of this antibiotic or, or a placebo pill. Um, but of the remaining kids, uh, in total, uh, we ended up seeing about 90% improve. And so these went down from age seven uh, to up to 17. Um, and so the point is that um, 10 is absolutely right in the sweet spot. Uh, there should be a lot of parent involvement um, and uh, exposure therapy with kids is so much fun. Um, in fact, one of the things I love about it, and we do this with our adults who have as much fun, uh, it's just playful. You know, the other day we're, we're sitting there with water guns with contaminated water um, and we're having a super soaker fight. Now, the only part that's a little bit awkward is that uh, the, uh, one of the kids shot me kind of right in the, the groin of my pants and the dog <laughs> came around the corner. And, you know, and he knows what's going on, but you know, he's like, geez, Storch, you gotta get control of that. <laughs> but you can do the, the therapy, you can make it work. Um, and uh, you just gotta have some creativity, but also have a, a, you know, a laugh to the whole thing. Yeah. You know, uh, another one that has come up a great deal and I know is is a huge focus now and and i want to talk about some of your looking at this in terms of research as well as 
the correlates and the differential diagnosis of autism and OCD. Mm -hmm. About, of course, people with autism are can on the surface look like obsessive compulsive disorder. They have their very set ways of doing things. They can get very agitated if not. How do you help families kind of meander through the, what's the correct diagnosis in, in that? I know it's a tiny question, I know, but take, yeah. it, take it away. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, this is my back. Um, <laughs> you know, the, I, so I think that, you know, when you pull apart ASD versus uh, OCD, there, you know, there's some things that overlap, as you point out, but then lots of differences. So, for example, on ASD, the, the communication piece is, is very much different than an OCD, um, where we wouldn't see that impacted, um, just for one. Communication uh, is another aspect where you see some differences between the two. Um, and, uh, excuse me, um, and then kind of the way that people process information also would be different. Now, some of the, the features that are the same, um, one is kind of this co-occurrence of anxiety and OCD. So about 33% of people uh, on the spectrum have really true OCD. Um, and then a bunch of them beyond that have these kind of repetitive behaviors that are not considered OCD. Um, we see a lot of anxiety. So about 40, 50% will have some other anxiety disorder as well. Now, the way I think about OCD and, and ASD, and we've, we've done a lot of work in this uh, space, um, is is that it, it has to stand up to kind of the general OCD uh, smell test. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a clear obsession um, that's driving it. Now, the obsession can be more fear-based, like, uh, you know, I'm afraid that uh, I could take uh, a knife and stab someone in the head. Um, or it could be this just right, like this has to be done this way, and I'm uncomfortable if it's not. Um, but we want that it also paired with, with uh, the compulsion play. Um, and so we're pretty strict about that piece. And I think there are reasons why. Uh, there was a study about a decade ago that looked at a medication with a focus on repetitive behaviors in OCD. And I think what they were trying to say is that all repetitive behaviors are kind of based on anxiety. And, and the study failed. It didn't separate from a pill placebo. It was a massive expensive study. And I think the reason is that repetitive behaviors are not the same as compulsions. And they, they ended up grouping it together. Um, which which was a mistake. Uh, so we're really thinking about what are distressed motivated behaviors uh, in okay. terms of that co-occurring diagnosis. Now on the positive side, treatment works um, as well. So uh, around the same time that we started that one study I'd mentioned um, uh, with the antibiotic called decycloserin, uh, we got another large grant from National Institute of Health that, that was looking at um, if we compare you know, CBT that isn't adapted for kids on the spectrum to a more personalized approach for CBT for anxiety and OCD um, uh, versus, you know, doing the usual stuff. We found that that personalized approach was was much more effective. But the key to that um, was that there's a lot of exposure uh, therapy in there, um, but there's also a ton of family involvement. Um, and so that's really speaks to that kind of uh, uh, salience of that factor of get the whole family together to kind of restructure the environment. Okay. Our, our buddy, Dean McKay, has talked recently uh, on some of the listeners about misophonia, which is uh, issues with sounds. Where do you see kind of the crossover maybe in a, uh, as, as Selena here asked about sensory motor issues in OCD and maybe misophonia and OCD as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we ended up uh, getting a, a large grant from an incredibly generous family uh, and foundation called the Ream Foundation um, to, to do what we call a deep phenotypic characterization of OCD, uh, I'm sorry, of misophonia. And, and so it, this is a, a tricky one and, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up. Uh, back in the day when we first started seeing cases through our OCD clinic, um, it, 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 um, well, maybe, uh, just before we get to that, yeah. could you, you give us just kind of a little breakdown of misophonia just for our, our audience well, members? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I jumped, jumped on that one. Um, so misophonia focuses on this, um, kind of selective sound sensitivity, um, that, uh, it can be very, very impairing, uh, to the individual. 
they often describe it as kind of painful uh, in their ears, um, but they often describe this kind of affective component. Like um, I get so, you know, angry or so like anxious or, or even like disgusted by it. Um, now it's usually uh, things like someone chewing, breathing, coughing, clearing their throat, um, uh, sniffing, but uh, eye blinking, but it can also be stuff uh, that, that actually has no sound. Um, like uh, someone crossing their legs and kind of shaking their foot like that, um, you know, or or kind of, you know, me moving my finger like that. And so those triggers uh, evoke a tremendous amount of distress for individuals. Now, we really don't know where it sits. Um, and and so originally we, we saw it in our OCD clinic, we saw some people doing better with exposure therapy, um, but as we got more experience, we realized that most folks weren't doing very well with exposure therapy. Um, and so we've shifted our model um, uh, within that to be more focused on how do you kind of tolerate the distress associated with it? How do you learn how to you know, not let uh, misophonia um, control you uh, or impact your life? Now, um, I think one of the, the hard pieces uh, of this is that we still don't know enough about it. Um, and so this one study we're doing, uh, we're actually recruiting right now um, for kids with misophonia um, relative to kids with anxiety and OCD, um, right. is that we're trying to understand how groupings take place. So for example, there's one group of kids with misophonia that clinically I've seen have a lot of things like OCD, um, you know, anxiety, depression. There's another group that kind of factors in with this ASD component um, or comorbidity. And then there's another group that's just, they just have misophonia. Um, and so we're trying to uh, determine, are there certain clusters? Um, and then are there kind of neural signatures um, that, that might explain um, or differentiate one group relative to the next, if in fact there are those groups? So we we're about to start and then this uh, pandemic thing hit. And so we're about two weeks away from uh, starting up and my, my lovely 11 year old, um, who is down here giving me the peace sign, getting a late night snack, is going to be uh, our our pilot case where we get to test uh, all of our apparatus on her. Oh, fun. <laughs> oh, very She's going to be the thumbs up saying, I'm the best best dad ever. <laughs> I'm how, about, ever. how about sensory motor? So then if we have a little, like, there's a tag on my clothing or... Uh, something just a seam on my sock or, or, or various other things that don't feel just right. Uh, how do you, how do you, I know you've done some work in that area too. So, yeah. yeah. And as likewise with our friend, uh, Dean McKay. Um, it, it, yeah. We, we try to approach it very similar to OCD, um, kind of recognizing the trigger um, and the person and trying to reinforce the person's ability to tolerate that trigger um, without kind of escaping from it. Now, sometimes a little bit different from OCD, we might uh, think as a second resort, um, can we uh, adaptively accommodate this? Um, so what that might mean is if someone was you know, driven crazy by a tag on the back of their T-shirt, well, if we get them a tagless T-shirt, what happens then? Um, or, um, excuse me, if they, someone just doesn't like you know, tight pants, if we give them something a little bit looser, do we see some benefit? So we're, we're a little more flexible in terms of thinking of those kind of sensory uh, aspects um, if it, more of an exposure approach isn't immediately working. Great. Lisa says, my OCD didn't start actually to show until I was in my teens, and I don't know if my family would be interested in participating in my OCD treatment. What would be some advice for Lisa to help kind of let her family know about what she's going through and how she might be able to help motivate them to help her. Yeah, I it, it's so every family, of course, is different and some get it more than others. Um, you know, one of the ways that that I I try to approach uh, some of the work I do is just by by kind of asking people for help, um, you know, and that may come in the form of, of hey, this is something that's going on with me. Um, I've decided that it's one of my values to try to take this on but I need your help. Um, would you be willing to, you know, come to session with me to help me think of ways of confronting, uh, confronting my fears? Um, or would you not, you know, 
that if I start asking questions again and again, would you not answer it, you know, in a certain way? Um, but I, I always find trying to engage people and explain why and express your interest um, and, uh, and your need of their support uh, can be, be the most effective. If they're not responsive to that, then, you know, it, it may be one of these things that you have to turn to someone else who loves you um, to try to get their support. Um, and, I, you know, on the one hand, I wish it, it, it weren't that way ever, but, but we, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and it's about kind of getting our way uh, towards that light, um, you know, and staying focused on, on what we need to do uh, in order to achieve those goals. Um, so I might give some of those things a try. Sometimes just having folks come into a session with you, talk to a, a, a therapist or a doc uh, who, who really understands OCD can be really helpful too at, at kind of taking uh, yeah, or supporting your voice. Maybe some literature too, leave a few things around the house, you know, just what is this pamphlet or what is this book about OCD doing here? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, if people kind of, you know, read through it and start to get some understanding that might be, that might be a, a way to get, get into it as well too. Br Britt asks, what are warning signs to watch for in small children who have parents that have OCD? Any, have you done anything in that area? Yeah. So we haven't, um, it, it, clinically, yes. Uh, uh, not so much research wise, other than <laughs> kind of early intervention. Um, but, but I, I think what you look for are, are kind of these, you know, anxiety, um, provoked behaviors. Um, so whether it, it becomes in the form of, of just anxiety in general, um, or more obsessive compulsive symptoms, uh, I, I think you're, you're on the lookout for that. And, and really thinking about this idea of, um, you know, little kids, little problems, uh, and bigger kids become bigger, pro have bigger problems. Uh, we want to appreciate that, you know, a three-year-old is going to have their symptoms engage the family uh, much more than a 13-year-old. Um, and so that can be one, one piece uh, of the puzzle. You know, the second thing that I think is really important, you know, we had this question about um, uh, exposure and response prevention uh, mm -hmm. uh, earlier. But, you know, what I always think is funny is that an OCD is called exposure response prevention. But in every other anxiety disorder, it's just called exposure therapy. The reality is they're exactly the same, right. um, except in social phobia or separation anxiety. The, the response prevention is we don't let the person escape or avoid it. Um, and so, so it's the exact same type of treatment. So like if you have a five-year-old who's you know, refusing uh, to you know, uh, separate from you to go to you know, kindergarten or preschool, well, guess what? The treatment is is that you actually you know peel them off, drop them off, get out of there, uh, and then you know go have a drink. Uh, but but it's it, it's the same thing that we would do in OCD. And the beauty of it is is it's a little bit more simple. It doesn't make it less heart wrenching. Um, but that same core component of have kids face their fear is a helpful piece because it also allows them to develop and see that they are in fact capable um, of of kind of independently relatively speaking, living effectively. Yeah. It's so one interesting question on there as well, too, of a parent who says they have OCD, and then, of course, their OCD picks on them saying, well, maybe you're not there emotionally enough for your children because of your OCD, even though it's your OCD that's causing you to have some of those very things. And, and that's where I just talk about kind of the jerkiness of OCD. Hey, um, uh, you have me, and I'm a major pain in your butt, and then I'm going to punish you for having me uh, as well. And and just how you, it, it's so hard to escape from it. And, and remember this uh, in that kind of situation. It's not about beating OCD. It's about walking away from OCD and recognizing that OCD is going to throw things at you no matter what situation that you're in. And it's not about trying to beat it down because OCD always wins every argument. I don't know about you, Eric, but I've never once won an argument against OCD. <laughs> I mean, never <laughs> in my entire career. But, no, well said. Well said. I, I, you know, we just, I, I, that's why I focus on the exposure piece. Um, it's about the learning that you get from it. And, you know, you brought up the, the notion of driving, which is the exact same uh, a parallel I use. Um, and, and the reason why you don't think about it is because you've driven so much and you know that you're probably not going to get in an accident. And if you do, it's probably not going to kill you. And it may even result in a new car for you. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, so, 
so it, it's that idea of, of life teaches you and, and OCD and its rituals keep you from engaging in that piece. The other thing is you said you'll never beat OCD in an argument, but OCD never tells you something positive. Um, it's always the same general theme and it's always negative. Um, and so it's a little bit like that annoying friend uh, or annoying colleague that always tells you something bad. You just got to kind of recognize it for what it is. And then if you're OK, it just cares if it's OK. You know, and, and I've been using that a lot lately with my patients to say that OCD doesn't give a crap about you, but yeah. it sure wants you to give a crap about it. Well said. Hmm. Dr. Eric Storch is with us tonight. Thank you once again for joining us on our Wednesday night NoCD webinar. NoCD is a downloadable app through iOS and Android, and you can go right over there to that little uh, yellow box over there. And if you click on that link, you can link to our care team where we'll do a free 15-minute uh, discussion with you. And if it looks like it'd be appropriate, you can do a diagnostic assessment with one of our therapists. Uh, Dr. Storch has listed his studies that are going on currently. Please feel free to look in the chat and contact him or his team. And uh, I hope that you will consider doing that because I know that you're in recruiting and, and that would be great to be able to get some of those recruits. So uh, any parting words for us tonight, Dr. Storch? Um, one of, uh, there's always hope. Um, you know, as I was looking through the comments, uh, you know, I, I, I see, you know, there, there's been a, a lot of suffering, a lot of difficult time. Um, but there is always hope um, and, you know, keep fighting, keep uh, trying. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there uh, that, that are here to support you. So wishing you all the best. Wonderful. Thank you for listening, everyone. Dr. Stewart, since you got on first, you've got the uh, exit button right above your picture there. So when you hit that, we'll be done. But we'll see you all next week for our first Diversity Matters no CD Wednesday night webinar. Please join us and we look forward to having you there. Take care, everyone.